Hey, geology and national parks class. Let's talk about deserts and Death Valley National Park. Pictured here is a flat salt pan with a rock sitting on top of it. And you can kind of see behind it a track that it's been moving along, which had been a mystery for a long time, but scientists now think they have an explanation for how something like this moves across a salt pan. All right, so Death Valley, it's in California, southeastern California, behind the Sierra Nevada mountains. It's part of the Mojave Deserts, and it's the hottest, lowest in terms of elevation and driest land in the U.S. Yearly estimates or annual rainfall is about two inches. We get that in a summer afternoon in central Florida. Summer temperatures regularly exceed 120 degrees Fahrenheit. That's brutal. And <clears throat> the reason why this place is so hot and dry is, it, it is because it's behind the Sierra Nevada mountains. And that creates a rain shadow effect where air masses that move across the mountains lose all their moisture because of um, being forced upwards because of the Sierra Nevadas, forced upwards to form clouds and then rain. And those air masses lose all their moisture by the time they get past the Sierra Nevadas and into Death Valley. The valley floor near Badwater, which is the lowest part of the national park, is about 282 feet below sea level. Okay, so when you go to the beach and you look at the ocean, right, it's down pretty low. Death Valley or Badwater, the salt pan there, is 282 feet below that level. Um, and this place is beautiful. There's a lot of uh, different desert colors, a lot of different features in the park that are worth exploring. Um, a lot of ranges with ancient rocks that are exposed, and it's essentially a portion of the Basin and Range province. There are valleys, there are springs that feed small rivers and ponds, uh, there are alluvial fans, we'll talk about what those are, canyons, salt pans, which are flat areas that are very dry, faults, fault scarps, sand dunes, and even volcanic features. It's huge! All right, three million acres. You can see it outlined here. And <clears throat> it's really right on the California-Nevada state line, much of the park. And then this is kind of behind the Sierra Nevada's way out here. So, yeah, flying to Vegas. The flights are typically subsidized by the uh, gambling industry. But don't gamble. Don't lose your money there. Just, just uh, take advantage of the cheap flights and get on out of Las Vegas. Um, Death Valley was established as a national park in 1933. Uh, I'm sorry, national monument in 1933, then was later established as a national park. Um, uh, please watch this video. It's probably like an intro to the park showing you really beautiful and nice places that you can visit. So here it is. Um, this is a close-up view of the entire park. And you can see uh, there are ranges here. Here, here, and then there are really low-lying valleys in between those ranges. Um, <clears throat> and there are a lot of historical sites in this area, too. Old mines, uh, old abandoned towns. Um, a, lot, a lot to see. This is Wine Glass Canyon. Um, this is part of the uh, Black Mountains. And the reason why it's called Wine Glass is because the canyons kind of look like... Uh, uh, wine glass in their shapes. Okay. Here's a view uh, from the crest of the Black Mountains. So on those ridges, if you look down to the salt plant pans, the salt pan areas are kind of the um, flat valley floors of this dry area. And um, this, this is uh, 
the view here is called Dante's view, and you can see the kind of white area uh, that is the salt pan. All this white material, um, this is uh, evaporate material. So as the few times it does rain here, um, when the water uh, kind of moves down the mountains, or if there's some, there's some of these ranges in the wintertime have snow. So uh, when that meltwater comes down, it'll evaporate in these really hot and flat valleys. And as they evaporate, they leave behind the dissolved solids and evaporates. And that's so gypsum, uh, salt, other um, evaporate materials. And that's why it kind of shows up as white. Here's uh, the salt pan floor. And they have, a lot of times they have the distinctive kind of cracking uh, outlines here. That's what it looks like. Some of the salt pan floors are different. Um, they can be more like crystalline and jagged. Uh, I think the Devil's Golf Course salt pan is uh, crazy looking. But these are the poly uh, polygonal blocks. And they can be um, anywhere between three and six feet across. And this is in Central uh, Death Valley. And then we have the Upibi Crater. Um, this is uh, a crater about one million years old and a few adjacent craters next to it. They're about a half a mile across. Um, and they're dark rimmed of basaltic cinders. Okay, and you can see some of the smaller craters here. And and what's what's interesting here is these, these are um, normally, uh, you know, Volcanic uh, structures are kind of up like this. <laughs> it's hard to draw here. But this is more of almost like a crater, almost like an asteroid crater. Um, and the reason they think it formed in this fashion was because the magma, as it approached the surface, came into contact with uh, groundwater, and that caused violent eruptions. Um, and, and the explosions kind of created these crater-like features here. And then also here are the Mesquite Flats. The Mesquite Flats are sand dunes that you can find here. Um, there are uh, a few, a number of different sand, sand dunes in this national park, although the um, they're not, they don't cover a great area. Um, because oftentimes, because sand dunes are beautiful, you can go over there, take a picture, and go, oh my God, look at these moving sand dunes. But they're actually a really small portion of the park. Um, and, and we'll 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 talk about sand dunes and where when we discuss um, uh, deserts. But there there are a lot of uh, dune fields that are dis distributed throughout Death Valley National Park. It's a very small fraction of the entire area. And the sliding boulders, like I showed you in that first uh, picture, it was a uh, a mystery for a really long time spurred up a bunch of different National Geographic documentaries where they always had to bring up aliens, right? But I think a, a team of, I think there were physicists figure, figured out how these boulders move along um, uh, this desert landscape. Um, because it's bizarre. There's nothing out here. There are no organisms that live out here that could push this material. There's no... Uh, it rains uh, doesn't rain very often, so um, this was really perplexing for a while um, until I think these physicists set up a camera to try to to try to track to see or catch the boulders moving. Um, and so what they figured out was, um, you know, in deserts it gets cold at night. It it drops um, below freezing freezing frequently. Um, and what happens is a thin la layer of condensed water uh, will freeze on the surface of the salt pan, and it kind of lubricates uh, the rock. And at night, there, uh, a lot of times there's uh, heavy wind, and then so the uh, sliding boulder or the boulder itself kind of glides on the surface uh, of the uh, salt pan floor. Um, and that really was 
uh, are the best explanation for this phenomenon. Okay, so let's talk about the geologic history of this area. Um, on the right there, you can see that's the geologic map. All right, so some of the oldest rocks here are Proterozoic rocks. They make up the basement, and that was a deep marine environment. The Pahrump group rocks are a couple thousand feet thick, and they represent long, continuate carbonate bank uh, deposits on a passive margin. Uh, occasionally, they're interrupted by layers of uh, sandstone that contain stromatolites. So this was um, uh, on a passive margin for a very long time. Then in the late Proterozoic, early Paleozoic, Dolomite and quartzite formations form, and metazoan life is present. Those are trilobites. And then moving on into the Mesozoic, that was dominated by dolomites, limestones, and tectonic activity, creating the thrust faults and magmatic plutons that are present in the surrounding area. Then more recently, in the early tertiary, the basin and range province begins to form. And that's what creates and kind of uplifts uh, some of the uh, current ranges and created some of the low-lying valleys. Um, and since then, really over the past 16 million years, is the um, uh, what shaped the kind of landscape that's presently seen at uh, Death Valley National Park. And the valleys themselves are kind of filling up with sediment from uh, the erosion of these exposed, uh, um, f faulted, uplifted ranges. So what is it meant to be dry? Why is, are certain areas on Earth super dry? Well, a dry climate is where there is more evaporation than precipitation. And there are a lot of dry areas on Earth. Over 30% of the Earth is covered by dry regions. And there's two different climatic zones that refer to these water deficient areas. There are deserts, um, and there are steppes. And steppes are semi-arid regions. Desertification is the is the process where you have degradation of dry land ecosystems like steppes and they convert into desert-like conditions. And this is a problem that is expanding worldwide. So if we look at um, a world map here, so Death Valley is part of the Mojave Desert. So that's in this region here. Here are the major uh, desert regions in the, United, in the United States and into Mexico. The Chihuahuan, the Sonoran, Mojave, and the Great Basin. Okay, um, But if we look uh, there are a lot of desert regions around the world, Sahara being the largest area here, Arabian, okay, this goes into the Iranian over here, then up into the Gobi Desert and these regions. There are major desert regions in Australia um, and in uh, South Africa and the driest desert in the world here in Chile. And there's the Patagonian Desert here. And if you notice that there's there's kind of this pattern of deserts being along this latitude north of the equator and at this latitude south of the equator. And there's a reason for that. Um, and the reason is uh, atmospheric circulation. Okay, A lot of these subtropical deserts and steppes lie between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn. That's like 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south of the equator. Um, and in some areas, you have unbroken desert environments for over 9,300 kilometers, <coughs> Sahara Desert. And the reason for this is, is subsiding air masses. Okay, So these are regions of typical high pressure, where you have a lot of sinking dry air that is compressed. Okay, And so what that leaves is very few chances for cloud formation and for rain. So let's take a look at that. Here's a three-dimensional model showing us the atmospheric circulation, the general atmospheric circulation on Earth. Okay, So in at the equator, I don't know if you've ever been, it's really hot and it rains a lot. 
uh, we, this is where the majority of solar radiation uh, strikes the Earth directly. So it heats up those air masses, and when you heat up air masses, they rise. So just imagine here, they rise as well, okay? And they rise uh, up into uh, upper layers of the atmosphere, and then they, um, in the northern hemisphere, they start going northward, and in the southern hemisphere, they start going southward. And these air masses, when they're at really high altitudes, they start to cool down, and they lose their moisture, right? Because they rained on their way up uh, on the equator, and they kind of lose their moisture, and they cool down in the upper layers of the atmosphere. And what happens when they cool down is that they get heavier, or um, more dense, okay? And they have less water, they're more dense, and so then they start to sink. And then they sink directly at the subtropical high, which is right here, which is kind of like where that band is where we have very dry weather, and also right here in the southern hemisphere. So you have a lot of sinking cold and dry air at those latitudes, okay? And as they sink, then they go on the surface and they move southward and they warm up and they get moist again and then they rise. So it creates that convection cell. And this is just the two convection cells from the uh, equator to, to the uh, Tropic of Cancer and Capricorn. And you can see that from space. Astronauts will kind of point that out. Yeah, here's a, those desert bands. And that's because of that subsiding air. <laughs> Um, there are also deserts as a result of ocean circulation. Um, West Coast subtropical deserts form because cold ocean currents that come from higher latitudes kind of move southward or northward, depending on what, which hemisphere you're in. Um, and that cools the air above it and prevents, uh, uh, prevents it from rising and basically leaves little cloud formation and precipitation. So those are often very foggy areas, like the very dry Atacama Desert in South America and the Namib Desert in Southwest Africa. If you notice, these, these, bo these places are both on the west coast of a continent, and they have very cold water uh, traveling on their coastline. And so that really dries up the landscape there. Um, and then uh, at mid-latitude deserts, um, Places that are sheltered in the deeper interiors of major land masses, like the Gobi Desert in Central Asia, um, and there's another desert just um, uh, west of that, uh, those are far removed from the ocean, and that means they're far removed from moisture. Uh, a lot of times air masses pick up their moisture from kind of hanging around their source region uh, of the ocean. Um, another way you can uh, kind of dry out of land is through mountain barriers, okay? Um, so when winds kind of uh, hit certain mountains, the air is forced upwards, and as it ascends and it rises, it expands and it cools down, and that causes the water vapor in that air mass to condense to form clouds, uh, and then it rains. And so that's why um, uh, certain areas like, uh, um, like in the state of Washington, the Cascade Range acts like this kind of mountain barrier, and Seattle gets a lot of rain because uh, the westerly winds kind of move through that area. They hit the Cascades, that the, that area is forced upwards, um, and, and it rains a lot there as a result. And the other side of the Cascade Mountains, like Spokane, Washington, is really dry as a result of that. So we, we call those rain shadow deserts. So the coastal ranges, Sierra Nevadas, and the Cascades, um, those are examples of those. Okay, I think I've got a picture. Here we go. So think of this as kind of like your Seattle climate, your coastal range and the Sierra Nevada range here. Okay, so here's the Great Basin or um, Death Valley National Park, right? So we have Winds moving in, the windward side is really wet. All this air is forced upwards, cloud formation, rain. And then on the other side, this is the kind of uh, desert landscape you would see because of the, the dry air that's kind of coming over the mountains and into this area. Oh, here's that example of 
uh, Washington and the Cascade Mountains. You can look at the numbers here. You have really high numbers. Um, this is all in centimeters, annual precipitation. So right here, this is kind of like where the ranges are. Uh, you have really high numbers here. You have uh, anywhere between like 100, this region, and up in terms of rain. On the other side of uh, this, the Cascade Mountains, you only have 50, 25, 50 centimeters uh, of annual pre uh, precipitation. So we're in kind of this region from that rain shadow. So mountains act as like a, a, a very big barrier for moisture. All right, so the geologic processes that are present uh, in arid climates, uh, one of the most important is weathering. Um, chemical weathering is not as prominent, and that's because the absence of moisture. So me mechanical weathering is, is uh, more prevalent here. Some chemical weathering does occur over long time, time spans, and it produces very thin soils. Um, it oxidizes a lot of the uh, iron-rich sediments and rocks that may be exposed in these regions. But water still plays a role in shaping uh, these dry landscapes. Um, there are streams in these areas, but they uh, will mostly be dry throughout the entire year. Uh, we call these ephemeral streams or intermittent streams that um, will show up only when there's some, uh, uh, you know, that infrequent rain. Okay, um, and so they may flow for a few days, a couple hours, and then that's it. And all that water will just infiltrate down into the ground or evaporate away. And so what happens is in these regions, when it rains, it's too much to soak in the ground, and most of it flows off as runoff. And a lot of times there's a phenomenon called desert floods, and these can arrive suddenly, like almost like flash floods. Uh, the YouTube video here, please watch, it's a very satisfying, actually. It's a desert flood, and a lot of materials kind of moving through this kind of dry river channel. And it's, uh, it's kind of relaxing, actually. Here's an example. Uh, this is a dry riverbed, right? And this is what you typically see, you know, nine times out of ten if you're walking through this region. But every once in a while, when there is rain, um, then you get a lot of runoff and you get really quick flash floods in an area like this. So there are different names for ephemeral streams around in the world. Uh, uh, in the western United States, we have a wash or a royo. Um, in Arabia and South North Africa, it's called Wadi. In South America, it's Dunga. And in India, Nulla. So everyone, people like living by rivers. Here's uh, a Wadi in its dry state. Okay. It's a satellite image of uh, a Wadi in North Africa. And it's in Niger. And so following a, a period of rain, you have freshly sprouted vegetation, and the, the wadi turns green. So there are some permanent streams in, in desert regions, um, but it, it's more of like special cases. Um, a lot of times these, the water originates, uh, or the river itself originates outside the desert region, and it just kind of happens to run through those latitudes. Uh, something like uh, mountains that are outside those latitudes are really high elevations where there is more precipitation. Um, and so it must produce enough water to compensate for the loss of water as the water runs through that arid, arid region. And the best examples of this are the Colorado and the Nile rivers. So while they're infrequent, running water across the surface of a desert does most of the er erosional work there. Okay, so let's focus in on the Basin and Range province because we're talking about Death Valley. Arid regions typically have interior drainage because those intermittent streams can't make it all the way to the ocean because it's not enough water and it evaporates too quickly. So the Basin and Range province has basins. They're local base levels. So the erosion occurs without reference to the ocean. Remember, bad water is 282 feet below the surface of the ocean. 
So what happens in this type of uh, landscape is you have uplift of those mountains and then the running water transports a lot of materials into those basins. And that's occurring in uh, Death Valley as well. So here's the landscape evolution of the basin and range province over time. And so you have uh, kind of ranges, basins, right? We know this from tensional stress, thinning of the crust, forming of those uh, normal faults, large normal faults that form. And so you have these ranges and they're slowly eroding away and all this sediment that's produced is just deposited locally here um, in these valleys, okay? And so over time, uh, the ranges kind of um, weather down to nubs, and we call those inselbergs. So the sediment-laden rivers uh, from those sporadic rains uh, deposit debris at the mouth of a canyon. Go back and think about that picture that I showed you of uh, Wineglass Canyon. Um, uh, from Death Valley, that runoff, so as like all that water is diverted into the valleys of the ranges and then it, that runoff spreads out over uh, gently slopes and quickly loses velocity and it creates a fan-shaped sediment. And we call that an alluvial fan, okay? Um, the coarsest materials deposited out first and then smaller materials deposited a little further away. And then... Um, a bajada forms when you have coalescing or multiple fans. So here's a, another image uh, of some of the canyons and, and uh, alluvial fans that you would find um, at Death Valley. So this here would be one alluvial fan. So here, um, all, that's, all that water would run out here and then start dumping sediment just barfing it out blah, on this whole area. And then here's another alluvial fan. And if you notice, there's three alluvial fans. They're all coalescing. You can even see some of the areas where the new water has kind of cut through the alluvial fan. Um, but these coalescing alluvial fans would be referred to as a bajada. And, uh, and maybe this, you know, if you know Spanish, that kind of helps. Bajada means downhill. And I honestly think that uh, Perhaps some geologists early on were exploring this area uh, with a guide, and the guide uh, spoke Spanish. And they were like, sir, what's this? And the guy's like, I don't know, bajada, downhill. And thus, uh, a geologic term was born. We'll stick to that Spanish theme as well. So during these infrequent heavy rainfall events, a lot of those streams will flow across the Bahala down to the uh, very flat um, valley, and they'll create a very short-lived lake, and we call this a playa lake. Okay, um, the the dry, flat lake bed is left after the water evaporates away, and that could be a matter of hours or a couple days. And so, uh, again, in playa in Spanish means beach, and that's what those places look like. Remember Dante's view as you looked from the Black Mountains down into the uh, valley floor? You saw that kind of white almost looked like sand, but no, that's, um, uh, those are evaporites from all that evaporation. And then, as we talked about before, continued erosion uh, diminishes those mountains to a few knobs we call inselbergs. So here you go. Here's a playa in Death Valley here, right? And then uh, here's a satellite image of Death Valley. Um, you can see the ranges. In this area, here are the bajadas, or coalescing alluvial fans. Here are the ranges here. It must have been taken in the wintertime. There's some uh, snowpack here at the peaks of these ranges. Oh, the Panamint Range, okay. And this was taken uh, immediately after uh, um, a precipitation event. And so it uh, this, image shows you here, you can clearly see an alluvial fan. And then all this white material uh, are just evaporites left there. And then here's the recent rainwater forms these playa lakes. And then these playa lakes just slowly uh, heat up and evaporate away until they get, they get smaller and smaller and then completely disappear. And it's, it's really crazy too. The, it has some like kind of crazy chemistry because like 
as you start evaporating those lakes, it becomes more and more concentrated uh, in dissolved solids. So the water becomes like saltier and saltier and brinier and brinier. And so you get these really strange um, evaporite minerals crystallizing from the water uh, when these events occur. All right, there's a lot of transportation um, of sediment by wind in deserts. Um, and this differs from running water in two ways. Wind has lower density, so it can't really pick up coarse materials. So it's really just clay, silt, and fine sand that is picked up by the wind. Um, and wind is not confined to channels and can spread sediment over really large areas. And in Death Valley, we know that uh, wind transportation is important because there are areas where there are dune fields. Okay, so just like rivers, uh, wind has a bed load, which is it carries materials close to the surface of the earth. It's mostly sand grains. And they skip across the surface of the earth. We call that saltation. And the height of the bed load rarely exceeds one meter. Okay, so this is just one meter is about, what, three and, and a third foot. So it kind of just hops up to that height and, and falls back down under the force of gravity. Here's an image showing uh, a sand dune and the wind picking up and picking up some of the sand grains and it kind of flies off and is transported in that fashion. Then there's a suspended load. Um, uh, this is carried up high into the atmosphere. It's mostly silt and clay sized material. Um, uh, and, and so this is very fine material that can be picked up uh, really high up uh, and carried by these winds. Okay. Um, imagine uh, like uh, someone peeling out in their car on a dirt road and you see all that dust kicking up in the air. It's kind of like that. That's the suspended load. And they can be, tra they can be transported really far distances. For example, um, dust from the Saharan Desert can move across the entire Atlantic Ocean and be deposited in the Caribbean. And in fact, there are deposits that reach Florida from the Saharan Desert. Here's a satellite image showing uh, dust plumes in the air from the Sahara, and they're making their way into uh, the Caribbean and towards Florida. It's estimated there are about 4 million tons of dust from the Sahara uh, that go to the Amazon basin. And then there are other times during extreme drought. Uh, this is the Dust Bowl era in the 1930s. Um, uh, we had an extreme drought, and, and uh, the winds picked up a lot of dust uh, and created these crazy storms. Um, and so this causes erosion. Um, if you compare wind to glaciers and running water, wind really is a very insignificant erosional agent. Um, it's most effective in these arid regions, and the reason is because there's scant vegetation. And that, it really, like if you have a lot of vegetation, that would prevent a lot of wind erosion. And so when this plays uh, a major role is in, in times of extreme drought or in dry landscapes. So uh, one way that this happens is through deflation. That's the removal of loose material. Um, sometimes it's hard to notice that deflation has occurred because the entire landscape may have uh, been lowered at the same time. But occasionally, like I'll show you, um, you can have a, a few desert plants um, and the roots will hold down that material and then everything else around it has been blown away. So we call those um, blowouts or shallow depressions. Sometimes they can be 50 meters deep and a couple kilometers across. Um, here, this, this example is... Um, it, that, it's actually pretty vast. So here's a, an entire blowout. All right. So all this material was kind of blown away, and then these plants are the only thing that's holding any material down. So this was about uh, four feet of soil that was uh, removed from this entire area. Um, in deserts, what you'll also find um, is this. Uh, there's no, a lot of times there's no need to even pave roads on deserts because there's desert pavement and it's uh, a veneer of pebbles and cobbles all kind of mixed together and pushed down. And so it forms kind of like an initial surface. 
and fine and wind, uh, wind-blown grains are kind of trapped in between the pebbles, and then infiltrating water and gravity kind of move sediments beneath the cobbles. Okay, this is what desert pavement looks like, just like uh, maybe like a gravel parking lot. And there's two kind of um, main ideas on how they form. One is is that uh, your desert landscape is made up of a bunch of different pebbles, dis you know, interdispersed all over. Uh, um, uh, the landscape and over time as you get more and more deflation that'll carry the small particles away and the wind will can't you know is not strong enough to carry the larger pebbles and coarser material so over time what you're left with is that desert pavement another idea is that um, y y it's dry so you have exposed bedrock and exposed bedrock broken up into cobbles and all that stuff and over time, you have the deposition of deflated sediment via wind um, and then water kind of uh, uh, pushing that material below uh, the uh, coarser material. And then you have a lot of fine material sitting below the coarser material above. So there's kind of a debate whether uh, the way in which desert pavement forms in these two fashions. Um, other kind of desert wind eroded features, um, vent effects and yardangs, uh, wind abrades material. And I don't know if you've ever experienced uh, being anywhere where there are, uh, where there's a lot of wind blowing in your face. You can get wind burn um, on your face from persistent wind. Um, and because sometimes the wind can carry small particles of sand and that can hit you and abrade your face and scratch you. So if if you're kind of a pebble or a rock just sitting on the surface of a desert, you're going to be hit by wind kind of through hundreds and thousands of years, and that causes scraping. And so the windblown sand that kind of uh, is bumping and skipping on the surface, um, that cuts and polishes rock surfaces, okay? And uh, w the wind also creates kind of streamlined landforms. Um, and we call those yardangs pictures. Here's an example of a vent effect. A vent effect would be like a, a gravel or pebble that has been kind of cut into this triangular shape, and that's via sandblasting from the wind. And much like, um, I don't know if you notice, like in places where you have trees and there's persistent uh, wind, and then the tree kind of grows like lopsided like this because the wind direction is in that direction. Well, here, the same thing happens here. If you have exposed uh, rocks, they can form these yardangs, wind sculpted landforms. Okay, so there's two de de uh, uh, depositional landforms created by winds. Dunes, uh, very common. We see that in uh, Death Valley National Park, um, where you have mounds and ridges of sand that are kind of shifting back and forth with the wind's bed load. And then there are loess deposits. Loess are uh, extensive deposits of silt. And that's stuff that's carried high up in the wind. Um, let me just show you pictures, I think. Oh, okay, well, let's talk about sand dunes first and then we'll, we'll end it with a, a loess deposit. Um, but sand will accumulate wherever there's an obstruction um, of the wind flow and, and that's where you'll have a dune. And so a lot of times dunes will form around a clump of vegetation or rocks. And dunes, tip, dunes typically have an asymmetrical profile. They have a windward slope, which is gently inclined, and a leeward slope, what's called a slip face. They're a lot like the glacier features, right, uh, where you have that gradual rock uh, there, and then the glacier is moving in this direction. And this is the predominant wind direction. Okay, so let me show you that. So here's... White Sands National Monument, and you can see here, this is the, uh, um, the slip face. So this is the, the steeper side of the dune, and then the other side is the smooth side of the dune. So here's the, the wind moving in this direction. On this side is the smooth side of the dune, and then there's a, a kind of a steep cliff right here. Okay, so that's this is the slip face. And it's also fun, like if you climb up one of the ridges of the dunes, you can be like, ah, oh, jump down and slide down. Some people surf down these little sand dunes. Um, and as you have these sand deposits, sometimes um, 
the slip faces form inclined uh, kind of sand deposits and they help tell you the prevailing wind direction. And if this solidifies into a sedimentary rock, that's where we get cross bedding. Okay. Um, and we've seen that in other national parks, right? The cross bedded uh, uh, Navajo sandstone at Zion National Park, as an example. And this moving sand can be uh, troublesome for a lot of permanent structures like roads and buildings because uh, it can just, uh, it's a dynamic landscape. So it's just a shift, a change in the wind, and you've got sand blowing into an area, cover up arm or something like that. Okay, so here is, oh yeah, there we go, Navajo sandstone. Here are the cross beds here. This is how they form. So you have prevailing winds in this direction. Maybe there's a shift in the winds, and then the dunes uh, kind of change direction. Um, and then this is where you get, this is the cross bedded structures you get here. Oh, and there's a farm covered by sand. <laughs> it's like I knew we were going to talk about this. All right, so here are those dunes forming. That's got to be really frustrating. You know that they're like uh, supplying the water to their farm through groundwater too, right? It's not a broom large enough to clean this mess up. Okay, so there are different types of dunes. Um, they're classified into six basic types based on their size and shape. Barkin dunes are solitary sand dunes and they're shaped like crescents. Transverse dunes are a series of long ridges oriented to right angles from the prevailing wind. And barkanoid dunes are intermediate forms of those two. Uh, the other three are longitudinal, which are parallel to the prevailing winds. And this is where you have uh, moderate sand supply. Parabolic dunes are when vegetation partially covers the sand. And then star dunes are like isolated hills of sand that develop when you have variable winds. So here are the variable winds, and then you have these star kind of dune formations. Okay, so it's all really dependent on the direction of wind. Here's the parabolic sand dunes. Okay, these are the longitudinal. All right, um, and then this is the uh, Barkin type dunes, little crescents. These are transverse dunes, fairly common here. And then these are, this is like a mix of, of transverse and Barkin, Barkinoid dunes. All right, then there are loess deposits, and loess deposits are wind-blown deposits. This material is deposited uh, via storms over thousands of years, just carried up in the air and deposited into an area. But there can be huge deposits of this material. Um, loess deposits in China originate from desert regions from Central Asia. Okay, eons and eons of just dry areas and silt carried away by the wind. And loess deposits in the United States and Europe is a product of glacial material. So here, let me show you an example. This is about a 10 foot high um, uh, deposit uh, bluff of loess material uh, near the Mississippi River. This is in Illinois. And then here, this is in China, um, uh, loess material can be like dug out. And so uh, um, it has very, because it's compacted, very good structural uh, uh, strength, so you can kind of create cave dwellings within the loess deposit, and uh, you can see that here. Cheers.